Welcome, everybody. Um, this is our second edition of the um, Dino's Tales from the Tar Pits. Dino the Dino, which is me, 50 years of trading in a couple more weeks and 63 years on the planet. So I started when I was 13. Yes. Birthday money. My dad let me go open an account with his broker so he could kind of keep an eye on it. And that's when I started. Anyway, so uh, simple format. We're going to do this uh, every week this month and probably going forward. It's kind of fun. First piece is what happened this week? What's a week rack week's recap? And um, this week is interesting. I've got the 30-minute the up here just to kind of keep an eye on the rotations. We had that perfect little pop-up that took out the initial balance, and then we just retested it. But anyway, I'm leaving that up just because that was interesting to me. But here's a, a good look at the week if you just look at the TPO view here. And, um, you know, I have this broken down into the overnight. You guys have seen this before, the overnight and regular trading. And basically, you know, we've kind of held where the week started, you know, more or less we're working a range. You know, I said last week, I said we had been working a range and the, the thing to be really aware of was the extremes of the range. Well, guess what? You know, we're kind of working a new range now. It's a little higher up, not much. And there's still some artifacts below us that are really interesting, but there's also artifacts above us. And actually today was fun because we, we had uh, single prints and we went and got them and after that initial push down. So, you know, my my view on this is pretty simple and, and there's a better place to look at it than on the TPO view to kind of get a sense of the point about where I'm going with, you know, what I think's going on this week and what to look for next week. Don't forget Monday's a holiday. Martin Luther King in the United States, so the, um, the exchanges are closed, the futures are closed. Um, so, you know, short week for Tuesday will be very interesting. Um, keep that in mind, but before we get to that, this is uh, the dailies on a one hour or one year scale rather. And, uh, and the line that I'm drawing is high to low. So you can see the fib retracements. You know, it's a simple way of looking at, you know, how much have we bounced? That's the simple um, English version of Fibonacci retracements. And I don't, you know, I don't trade off this stuff, but I, you know, I used to a little bit, but now it's just kind of reference context. And just what jumps out at me over and over about this as I'm kind of looking at the week is this. Um, look where, so on the right, ES. Okay, ES is at 38%. So that's a classic bounce off of a move down. You know, that the, the, the down move is intact at that point. It goes into what's called the ambush area, which is a little higher up, you know, 50, 60%, that area. That's where typically people that are looking for a reversal of the trend will start going with it. And it's also where the people will who are looking to fade it will fade it the most aggressively because it's basically the line at the top of the trend. And we've we've not quite gotten there in ES. So that's keep that in mind for a second. Then let's look at NQ. NQ has not even bounced 23% off of its low. So again, the moral of the story is we, we have not even bounced a typical amount yet in a down move. So anything can happen down here. I'm not suggesting we're going lower, but from here up to the, you know, the classic um, ambush zone, which is again, you know, 50 to 61% area. Some people would say, you know, 38 to 61, whatever. It's up here and we're nowhere near it there. We're just entering it in ES, but here's the fun stuff. Look at YM. YM is in it right now. That is by far the strongest of the, you know, the big indexes. And um, look at RTY, RTY as it usually is. And this is, you know, to Maria, make sure you note this. It's almost identically in the bounce to ES, which it just has a habit of doing. It pattern wise, RTY mirrors ES, even though they're completely different, you know, risk classes. I, I've, I've noticed that for decades and well, for, it wasn't always called RTY, but the Russell against the uh, S&P, it's, it's done that for a long time. and. I never really understood why, but it, it does. So you might as well respect it. It will always be a stretched out version. The volume profile of RTY will be a stretched out version of the volume profile of ES on any given day. And uh, so this is really interesting. YM, you know, real strong, already in the ambush zone, has broken out of the downtrend. All of the other ones are still in a downtrend, um, but they're right at the spot where, you know, the people that want to get long are arguing, well, we're going up now. And I'm seeing a lot of that on Twitter and whatnot. 
you know, a couple of people have posted about, and, and they're right, you know, the new highs and low and new lows, you know, the new highs is, is strong. And that's a sign of, you know, some sort of strength in the underlying uh, market. But I, you know, I don't think we're, we're done with, with uh, working through this, this bear market yet. I think it's a long way to go. I just think we had a little bit of news that, you know, made us pop. And we've seen that over and over again. If you go back and look at the uh, TPO view and crunch it a little bit so we get a little more of days. We've had these really big giant moves. And, you know, that was Thursday, right? That we had CPI, you know, it's only Friday. Um, so, you know, we, we still have lots of time for this to get priced in. So um, anyway, that's kind of my take of what's going on uh, this week and what to kind of look for for next week. You know, if this continues, you know, let's say we get back up above 4,000 and hold it and, you know, push up from there. Well, you know, that that could give us a nice little bounce, certainly, you know, a couple hundred more points. I just, you know, wouldn't hold my breath that, that that's in fact going to happen. One other thing I wanted to bring over here and show you guys, I guess right there is a good spot, is the internals again. Um, you know, this is just a couple of days at a time. Um, you know, I used to look at like five days at a time, but this is supportive of what I said earlier that, you know, the people are, that are looking at the new highs, new lows, and, you know, some of the more obscure, um, broad internal indexes of the broader market, you know, they're seeing some strength there, or at least a divergence in the down move. And, you know, they're right. That, that's showing up in the internals too. We're spending a lot of time during the day uh, uh, with a positive tick, and that's generally indicative of a strong market, or uh, a, of a market that's not going down. <laughs> now, let's put it that way. In other words, you know, it's, we're trying to bounce. I, that's pretty clear here. But uh, again, I'm not writing home yet, you know, that, hey, we've got a rally going on. You know, they still, they're still short squeezy. They're fadeable. You know, we had that big move earlier in the week. I was talking about that in that session. You know, you could trade that either way. Both ways was ideal and, and uh, had a lot of fun doing that. So anyway, that's, that's the big picture. Um, there's really not much more that I would go into about what happened, um, you know, this week and what to look for. I think it's a pretty clear picture, you know, executing against it is is a different story um you know you've got to be really patient but boy if you are there's just some really really nice setups i've i've been having a lot of fun with this stuff and it, it's been um productive trading now um where are we 10 okay good so that's kind of the the summary stuff the second part of uh tales from the tar pits here every week will be something um uh, psychological, you know, surviving as a trader kind of stories from the ta the actual tales from the tar pits, the tales themselves. That's what we're talking about. And I was looking in the pit, there was a bunch of really good suggestions. And um, I'm kind of going to, the topic I have today is kind of a, a blend of a few of the different topics. And so, you know, let me kind of just drift into it and, and you, you'll, you'll catch my, my, you'll catch my drift. How's that? Um, this uh, last week, I talked about how the hardest thing I think over time to be good at as a trader is to understand when conditions have changed and you know, intraday or, you know, general market conditions over, you know, a period of, of days, weeks, months, you know, it, if you're good at sensing change in conditions, you will always be nimble and you will always be on the right side of the market or you will get out of the way when you're not quickly. And I say that a lot. I say, you know, when I, if you watch my Twitter or watch posts in the pit or on Facebook, you know, I say, keep your head. I say, stay frosty, you know, which is military for keep your head. And um, I say, you know, be nimble and, um, you know, adapt, improvise, overcome. And uh, what I don't talk about or I didn't haven't talked about yet um, is how do you do that? And um, it's hard, <laughs> no question about that. But there are some things that I think are really good tips. So, um, so I thought I'd elaborate. I'd spent the second half, you know, maybe 15 minutes of this, you know, try to make this a half an hour total. So from now to the bottom of the hour or so, um, what does it mean to do that? Keeping your head, staying frosty, being nimble, you know, how do you do that? And one of the things that Maria brought up, delusions of grandeur. Oh, that is so much the killer of trading, uh, of good, of traders. Um, and let me put that one another way. Delusions of grandeur also manifests itself. And you know, Google that if you don't know what it means. It's, it's a pretty, 
it's a pretty simple picture if you if you look at the formal definition of delusions of grandeur. But how that manifests itself in trading often is the following, and I've I've done it over and over again, and I've coached people through it many many times. It, I it just see it over and over and over, and and that's the following where you know if things are going really well for a period of time, and you're feeling like oh I'm really killing this, you know. And that's the time you've got to be really careful. You know, you will make your biggest mistakes when you have um, a string of things going well. And and there's some really good psych psychological, uh, you know, bias reasons why that happens that I really won't go into because they're boring. The bottom line is it just does happen. And most people aren't prepared for that. They think, okay, I've got this down now. You know, I understand my risk. Da, da, da. And then, you know, one day they'll just do stuff and they don't even understand why they did it. You know, why did I, I was so stupid. I, you know, in hindsight, it looks like, you know, that you just can't understand how you were such an idiot, right? I mean, I'm, you've all been there. <laughs> and um, so how do you do this? And, 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 and what are some things to avoid? Well, first of all, if you're ever on a really good winning streak of any kind, what, if it just feels like that's what's happening, be very careful. Um, over and over again, I've seen people, that's when the most significant mistakes are made. And it's really easy to do that. You know, you think, oh, wow, I'm not, you know, you trust yourself and there's, you know, you have to have confidence, but you also have to question your own assumptions. And, and that's where stay frosty and kind of be nimble comes in. And there's a lot of esoteric ways to talk about that, you know, and delusions of grandeur, how do you avoid it? I have some simple ways that I avoid it. Number one is I separate the trading that I do to make money from the R&D, the research and development, the stuff that I do when I'm testing new ideas and, you know, and practicing scaling or trying a different scaling rate, like if it's swarming, you know, how fast do I scale a swarm setup? Um, I never do that stuff while I'm trading because I, I don't know what's going you know, I don't have a statistical view on that stuff. I'm, that's, I'm experimenting. And, um, but I also find that that's really necessary to, to number one, enjoy the whole you know career, and number two, to to get better. And so you know, if you were in the workshop in 2019, I used to say all the time that there's you know just a couple of things. I it's one of the signs that goes on my desk. There's a couple of things that I I really focus on. Number one, you know, for the for the money making stuff, you've got to get and be as mechanical as you possibly can be, and that doesn't mean automating it, although that could be parts of it. What it, what it means is to make the process as rigid and mechanical as you can so that it, if you're, you're either in your process or you're not, there shouldn't be any gray areas. And that's one of the things that takes people a long, 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 long time to learn because defining their process is, is nebulous. It's not a clear, clear thing for them. And, and, and it takes a lot of time to get really clear on what your process actually is, what's working, what isn't, you know, and there's a lot of good tools out there for that. So I'm not gonna spend any time on that. The psychology of that is important though. You will make fewer mistakes in your process world where, you know, being mechanical, where the, the, the idea and, and you, what you have to do is go in, make money, get out, you know, with whatever approach you have to the market. That has to be what you do there. But you can't just do that or you'll blow your head off after a couple of years. You have to have fun. You know, how do you have fun, Sims? <laughs> evaluation accounts that you can blow up for $13 or $20. You have to go do that stuff every now and then. Just don't do it with your primary stuff. Give yourself permission to play. That is the story there. And, and don't take that, you know, a lot of people say, oh, that sounds great. And they never try it. Try it. Trust me, you know, it, for example, you know, what's it like to trade, uh, you know, a hundred lot account, you know, or a 500 lot account, not micros, minis. What does that feel like? You know, to be a guy, you know, I talked about the hedge fund guys. Some of those guys have um, permission to trade a thousand lot in the ES. What does that feel like? Well, do it in a sim and try it. You know, it, it will, it will change your perspective on risk management and about, how small moves in the market, you know, by bigger players that are, you know, just taking advantage of ledges or, you know, very small, like these three tick algorithms we see all the time. Why do we see those all the time? Well, try it with a hundred lot and you'll see, you know, there's a lot of ways to make that work. So um, play, that, that's the moral of that piece. Give yourself permission to play and, and understand that delusions of grandeur will come number one, when you're not doing that. And number two, when you're, when you're on a winning streak, that's when you will make the biggest mistakes. 
And this is overwhelmingly why if you look at people, you know, in the first early part of their trading career, you know, over and over again, the story is, well, first of all, they don't have an edge. Then they get an edge and they're consistently profitable for a while, but they routinely blow up. Okay. Then they don't, that's because they don't understand risk management. Then they get past that and, you know, they, they get through a funded account and then they withdraw money. And you know, the, then the next problem is how to scale that. And that's where a lot of people stumble. You know, it, it's easy to work in a couple hundred dollar or a thousand dollar or a couple of thousand dollar a day, you know, mentality. When that starts becoming 10,000, it, it should work exactly the same way. And, and it mathematically, but psychologically, it doesn't. And so, you know, give yourself permission to test, play, try different instruments, you know, just just don't forget, you know, where you where you make your living, where is your process and and keep that mechanical and don't ever stray from that under any circumstances. You, you don't play there. You don't, you know, in the middle of a trade decide, well, my old scaling model, I can add more scale to this here. You, you can't do that. that. That's where you'll really blow up. So. Um, is there a corollary to delusions of grandeur? Hmm. That's what would the opposite of that be? Fear. Well, living in fear, being fear, a fearful trader would be, you know, and, and I, I, I've told, God, you know, I haven't told you guys this story in a long time. This is this they made a um one of those, you know, you know that those greed series that run on um on television. Oh, like American greed. Yeah, they, they made one about this guy and I knew him. It, he was a brilliant math mathematician in the 80s, back before you know you could trade this kind of stuff at home. You needed, you know, uh reasonable computers to do that. And um, you know. Uh, some sort of small mini computers. And so you needed investors to back your infrastructure. And this guy was in New Hampshire and, and no, it was New Hampshire. No, it was uh, somewhere up there in New England. I'll remember exactly in a minute. I don't remember his name, but anyway, it's a famous story. And it was American greed. It was one of their episodes. And basically he developed this ridiculously good model that worked so well that people were throwing money at him to trade it. And so he got this big house, Connecticut. That's where it was in Connecticut. Um, and he got this big house and he brought in all these coders and, you know, had the house wired with a, with a, um, a T1 line and, you know, just the whole nine yards. It was just everything was there and they were ready to go. And the date the fund launched, he couldn't pull the trigger. He had performance anxiety, literally. And so, you know, he tried a few different things and couldn't get it going and just he, he, he couldn't trust his own. So it was the opposite of that. Um, totally the opposite of delusions of grandeur. He had delusions of grandeur when he was creating it. But then when it came time to do it, he didn't trust himself. And, and this is really common. You know, this is the fear of success thing. Many people go through this. So long story short, what happened with him, you know, he started, he got into drugs and then there was hookers hanging around in the house and he basically blew up all the money and ended up, uh, you know, with an American greed episode on, on that uh, series. So and, you know, there was no doubt that his model worked. It was so clear. People threw hundreds of millions of dollars at him. And back then, that was a lot of money. Today, it's jump change. Anyway, so that's that's one part of that. And that was a great question, JVC, by the way. So, um, you know, permission to play, um, important. You know, keep your, your regular stuff really mechanical. And here comes a, a, a zinger for a lot of you. Um, I'll give you just some early details on this, but I, I started running my data with my buddy again. He, he's letting me do my birthday present a little early because of my move and, and I'm getting some iterations. And I, I was chatting with Lee about this a, a little while ago. Some really stunning revelations doing that. A couple of them I'll share with you. If you're doing evaluations and, um, you know, particularly with Axia or Axia, um, Apex having a, a sale again with 80% lifetime. From a mathematics point of view, from a risk management point of view, and from a risk reward perspective, and from a cost of drawdown perspective, you know, how many dollars you're paying once you get the live account, obviously, so for, for the amount of drawdown you're getting and the amount of contracts you can trade. This is what his model does really well, and it's why I like giving him stuff. It, it points out things that should be really obvious, and it, and it proves it mathematically and says, here's the result. Here's the proof. Guess what, guys? 
there is no justification whatsoever mathematically to do anything but 25K evals, which have one-to-one -one, um, drawdown to targets and um, the cost. Again, you know, you're buying $1,500 of drawdown for 140 bucks. If you plug all that into a model and then you compare it to say the 150K ones or the 250K ones that are out there, you know, take the 150, for example, it uh, has a $5,000 drawdown and a $9,000 target. So right there, that should, you know, that should be a, a light bulb going off. Those, you know, that's a lot more work to do. And you don't really get, you know, you're paying more for that, a significant amount more. And if you run that through a, a tool and say, here, Mr. Computer, take both of those things, take the current trading environment, and it, the, the computer comes back over and over again and says, there's no reason to do anything but 25. We couldn't even make the 50K numbers work because in the 50k you know your target's 3000 and you have 2500 of drawdown so you know again it's getting skewed and um and then the the one time fee for the funded account is a little more and you don't need the leverage that the additional leverage it gives you the you know i think there was that 10 contracts in that one or 100 mi micros um it's a more profitable exercise, no matter how you slice it up, to go in with fewer contracts and use the 25K and take advantage of the lower cost and the one-to-one -one ratio of the target to the drawdown. Um, there's only one exception to that and the computer doesn't make the mistake. So it doesn't you know, value the, 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 um, the risk of that, and if you're if you're somebody who allows the, the market to go against you a long way, you really have to sit down and map out the risk management for that. But anyway, the reason I'm telling you guys all this is um, this goes back to you know what does it mean to be nimble and what does it mean to keep your head? You know, we always want to be bigger than our britches. We have delusions of grandeur. That's where I'm going with all this. And I was really surprised, and we ran. I have three risk models now. I have the one plus one I've told you about, and I now have two swarming models, a baby swarm and a bigger swarm. And the idea was, you know, in ideal conditions, you could actually do any of them in any size account. And I, we ran that through too, and we just could not, we couldn't even make the 50K justifiable. The, the only thing we could do with the 50K that, that the model allowed us to test was um, it allowed for more sequential errors, you know, obviously, because you have a slightly bigger drawdown. So you didn't blow it up quite as fast, but getting it profitable and growing it, there's no advantage to having, you know, the bigger size and paying more money and, and having to get, and, and the reason there's no advantage is the additional time it takes to make the extra $1,500. You can't justify that. That amount of time, basically what the model said, and, and it, it blew my mind, but it came back and said, it, for that amount of time, you could have made the other $1,500 that, that you it would have taken over from the 25K to the 50, the additional 1,500, rather than doing that, fund the 25K, make the 1,500 there, and then you're, you're, you're at the floor. You've already, so you're, you're at the point where you can withdraw after that. You know? Think about it for a minute. You know, it, it's funny how this, this and again over and over again this is the beauty of this this model that they've developed and and it's a really really beautiful optimization tool but it keeps coming back with logic so so my point is if you can think about a way to do exactly what you may want to do with more and do it with a smaller number and tighter risk um that can really make it easier to not lose your head and easier to be nimble um, and easier to stay frosty because you can't, if you're trading a 25K size risk, you can't let the market get away from you. That doesn't mean, you know, you can't let uh, a couple hundred bucks of drawdown happen within a trade, but the model has to make it really clear where you're right and wrong. So we started fooling around with another thing with that. And this is going to be tighter risk is key, Jeffrey. And you're going to love this. I'm, just, I, I'm just getting to the, <laughs> to the big, the big, uh, the big reveal here. And, and then I'm not going to give you any details. We figured out a way to do this visually. <laughs> and, um, 
it's funny because you know and i, and I already talked to lee about this so the, <laughs> it, it's it's more horizontal lines on a view but there's a really good argument for them for this exact problem only. All we're doing here is saying, how do you manage risk in a 25K environment, you know, which is basically four minis or 40 micros. And the first part of the answer is you never use that much. You, you can do it with 10, 12. Um, the question is, where do you do it? You have to be statistically mindful of the range. And I say this over and over again, this is what I do. So here's the big reveal. Um, look at my five second views here. I've just got the, the big ones up for ES and NQ. I've, the, uh, the, the other two are just behind them. Notice anything different? Uh... You've got your usual three LRCs, unless the ratio. Oh no, there's a fourth one. There. Ah, right. there's a fourth one. Yes. I yes. didn't see it till it moved, and then it was yeah, like, oh, they're, yeah. Yeah, they're not bigger, David. They're not bigger. There's just one additional one, and really it's really tiny. Solved, really super it, now. No, 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 no. The other way around. Oh, way you went big. Ah, oh, you went okay. And here's why: there, there's only one mistake you can make when you're swarming a ledge. You know, and we're, we're at one right now. So this is a really good example. There's only one mistake you can make. If the market is, is either changing into a trending environment, you know, that's where you always get caught off sides. If we've been ranging and ranging and ranging and ranging, and now we're trending, that's, that's condition one. Or condition two is if we're trending in a giant range. And a couple of you have asked me about this, you know, in different sessions. And, and again, it's not just how many LRCs can I put on a chart? That's not the point here. What we did was we said, okay, where's the sweet spot when you're measuring statistical ranges? And you know these, so these are the same. This is two minutes. This one's about five minutes. This middle one's about a half an hour. So that's what was there before. And what I did was, and, and this is what our, the model is showing us right now. We added one more and it's just basically double. It's a 600. So it's about an hour. And when the market was really volatile this morning, it was amazing how, it, what this is doing is it's giving you the equivalent of what's on the left here. You have kind of this SD2, SD3, you know, if you, if you were here this morning, uh, let me zoom in a bit here. Uh, if you were here this morning, if you were trading this morning, remember, you know, we, we got on, on SD2 and we traded between SD3 and two for a long time until, you know, the market opened and some of that strength came in and, you know, we consolidated, you know, and then we formed the initial balance and, and moved up. Right. So while that was going on, you know, we could see that we were basically working those two extremes. And I've talked about this over and over again. You can trade within those two extremes a lot. But what what this doesn't tell you is when the trend's changing. And I had a bunch of people asking me about this. You know, how do you know? And, you know, here's the problem with swarming. If you're swarming the edge of that, if it continues to trend, you're just going to get further and further off sides. So we need a, a mechanical place to say, okay, here's what it can't do or can do. And it just did it right now. If it breaks over the boundary of the 30 minute one and goes to the 60 minute, that's the spot that has to hold for this particular directional move to still be valid. Right in there, that's the equivalent of, you know, in terms of how you act on it, it's the equivalent of like SD2 and three or SD3 and four over here at either side. That's the same thing. By that 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 sweet spot is right there between those two extremes. It tells you if you're if you're holding the direction or if it's fully going to change. Now again, this is not a trading signal. It's not you know you buy here, sell here. But if you're if you're scaling into this, let's say you're swarming long here, and that level goes, you're wrong. It's that simple. And so we ran that back and, and you know, put it back on as if it had been there so we could measure where it would have been and ran a whole bunch of trades against it. And it pretty much eliminates, see, see how it held? And now we're back in you know, the, 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 the one that really matters, which is the 30 minute. But this is the sweet area to watch right here when it gets past the 30 minutes, but it holds the hour. That's a sign that the, the direction is holding. People have asked me over and over again, you know, how do you find a line in the sand to use as an absolute for that? There's your answer. And so this is pretty cool, but that's all I have time to really show you about it. Uh, it's a really cool tool for, for keeping risk tight. 
And so, oh, here's the other thing I did, Jeffrey. We took all of my trades from my 50s and 150s and 25s. And, and that was where we came up with that, that statement I made a few minutes ago. Uh, it, 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 the, the, the 50s don't make any sense, you know, and, and the 150s clearly don't make any sense. Yeah, you can swarm a lot more aggressively, but you don't need to if you respect this. It's when you get off sides further than that that you need all that extra drawdown to work with. So if you keep it tighter within that, see, look how good that bounce was. It blew through the, the 30 minute range, so it caught enough people off guard, but it's respecting the direction that formed that range. And this is really, really powerful. Statistically, it, it you know, it's another, it's, it's not quite as significant as the last one, but it, it's not, you know, incremental. It's, it's, it's a, a significant degree of improvement, adding that one. And, and, you know, if you haven't already figured out, this is something I've been playing around with automating forever. And I, I to some extent, have it automated in Ninja. I, I haven't shown this to you guys yet, but that, that was what I was looking for. I'm trying to find, you know, process-based rules so I can just turn the trade on, you know, kind of like a, you know, a pucometer tool or something, only a much cruder, you know, visual pattern. So anyway, yeah, yeah, it's a very interesting experiment, Jeffrey. You know, now, hey, there's sales going on right now. You know, it's 80, 80, 80% lifetime. It, try some 25K, yeah, try one. But the point is, don't use all the leverage. Use the leverage at the right spots where it's really clear. And, um, you know, try... See if you can nail one in seven days doing that. It, you don't need the $1,500 drawdown. And, uh, and over and over again, we took the exact same data and we said, okay, it's a 50 or it's a 25. And in every single case, there's no exceptions to this. It was a much better move to do the 25, get it funded, and then you know, get it to the point where you could start withdrawing instead of trying to get that extra 1,500 bucks out of a 50K. It, as long as you can manage the risk. But again, I was I could not find a place to give you guys as a suggestion where okay you're really wrong if it goes beyond there well guess what the sweet spot is between the two you're really wrong if it blows through both of them and it doesn't reverse immediately look what it did on NQ it blew through the second one just barely and then look at the quality of the snapback so you just again you don't trade it's not an absolute because it's regression and regression is best fit it's not a channel it's it's a it's a interpretation of the data, but it's really powerful. It gives you a, a zoom out way of, of determining your risk of being scaled, or it also gives you really good spots to exit if you were going that way. You know, let's say you were short, you know, it tells you really clearly, okay, you know, that move at least for now is over. So anyway, um, I found this to be really cool and really powerful for those of you playing with the LRC stuff for scalping. Um, I think it definitely helps improve your risk management. In other words, it helps you be nimble, stay frosty, helps you keep your head. And, and it's really simple. You, you, you're trading with a lot less size. So when you are wrong at those extremes, which is really rare, you know, so far we haven't found an instance where that's wrong. Um, it, it, it's a very small hit because you're trading such small size. And you know, instead you're taking advantage of the, you know, the statistical understanding of the range. Hopefully that's helpful for you on the 25 K versus anything else. Does that in any way take into account the absolute cost of the evals? For example, I've got five uh, Bulinoxes right now at 15 bucks a piece, 50 Ks. Um, uh, no, so cheap. no, what it does is it assumes that the cost, and we actually brought this question up, JBC. It's a really good question. Hmm. And, and what we decided and what the, the math, the, the math advisors told us was assume that the cost is the same for any of the evaluations, because it doesn't differ enough when they're all on sale. That, that's, hmm. and, and remember your objective with the evaluation is to pass it quick right. as you can. But, but what's more important, you know, it, particularly the one-time fee, you know, we looked at the one-time fee for the two, for the 150 mm -hmm. and it's, it's oh, so much stupid, huge. Yeah. It's like 220 bucks or something. And, and, and the other one's like 140. It makes no sense to, to go through all of that extra work. The only thing you get out of that is more size, which you don't need. And it just, mm -hmm. and, and the point was the more size, not only do you not need it, but it was dangerous to have it. That's yeah, what sure. really, 
that's what really caught my eye, you know, and it, it, there was a couple of cases where I had, you know, scaled real aggressively on a couple of trades and, you know, it didn't blow up a 25, but I wasn't in a 25, I was in a 50. And if I had, you know, done it in 25 and just taken, you know, proportionally half the risk, it totally worked. And again, hundred percent of the time we couldn't find an exception. So this is really just, it, it's a refinement of the quality of the risk management process. That's what it is. So I'm trying, um, trying to figure out because I'm still at the point where with a few exceptions here and there, I still blow up evals and don't pass them in a month uh, that the $15, you know, per month, just, I, you know, given that I keep killing them, it seems to just make sense to stay with them for a while. But my, my thought on that is the following. Um, the, the, the low cost a month is attractive. I, I think uh, you can, the reason we tested the 50K so much is because here's the reason 50Ks blow up if your risk management is still pretty good. Um, because it trails and it trails 2,500, right? If you've gotten it close, like, you know, let's say you get it plus 2,000 and then you have a, a, a bad day or three bad days, or, you know, and it goes even getting it back to, you know, to break even, the trail has come up significantly because of that, right? Because you made 2,000. So it's trailed up. And so that's the thing. If, if, if consistency is an issue and you need the drawdown for that, then, you know, the difference in your monthly fee is nothing, you know, between the 25 and the, you know, at 80% off or Bullinox or wherever you're doing it, you know, the deal's the same, um, you know, for if you have a lifetime. But when you get to the funded part, that's where, you know, it becomes, a, you know, basically a cost benefit analysis. And it, it's really hard to justify even spending just a little more on the one-time fee for the 50K because, you have to make twice as much money before you can even start withdrawing. It, it just, you know, so for example, there's no way you could get to the 20% withdrawal bonus. You, you would have to push too hard oh, and you probably, Apex, right. yeah, with Apex, right. Cause you have to, but with a 25 K that, you know, that you bought when they were offering that and, you know, it's not hard in January to get it to the level and then take the withdrawal in the first week or two of February. That's doable, you know, and, Although it's aggressive, it's still doable if you just say, "Look, I, you know, I'm looking to make 150 bucks a day, and that's it." And and what what amount of risk justifies that? So, for for example, when you you get to a ledge, let's say, you know, we were looking at this ledge up here at the top of, of ES. Let me put the footprint back up. And um, yeah, we had a we, you know, this was a classic example of a weak break. You know, we we blew through just barely, put in a price rejector, and then boom, we slammed all the way back down to you know the middle, the high volume note. It, it turned out that was the VWAP when it did that. If you look right here, you know, that was when it got up there, and then boom, we came right back to the VWAP. I mean, it was it was you know textbook. And um, so my point is that. You know, if you wait for setups like that and then say, okay, how much risk can I afford to take, you know, on a dollar basis in something like a 25? And if I'm wrong there, you know, where do I have to get out to manage that risk? Or if I'm swarming it, how much could I swarm? For example, there's this other supply up here that was really obvious in the high 4,000s, you know, and if you look at the TPO view, you know, it was really clear what was going on up there. And, um, you know, can you, could you get in here and scale here? Would that work with the risk management that you're using? Whether, you know, it's one plus one or swarming light or swarming big or whatever your approach is. And that's the question you really need to answer. And then you need to religiously respect that. If you can do that, and if that lets you do that within $1,500 of drawdown, then you have to, you know, th then the ideal, the, the optimization is the 25K. On the other hand, you know, if that kind of a setup is within your playbook, and for me, it would be, but, you know, where was this? This was at 4,000. This was at 4,008. So if you were going to swarm that, for example, you'd have to be really, really slow you know, one here, maybe two, and then you'd have to wait till it got up there and then put on, you know, four, four or five more. And, you know, that would put your target, you know, right in here and that would be really good. Um, or, you know, you put the one on here and it would immediately turn so you'd make money on the one or the two that you put on there. So you really have to think that through. And, you know, for like NQ, which is my favorite instrument, obviously I've said that a lot, you know, when you get to a ledge here, the ledge was 38. You know, you have to understand how NQ trades. 
if it blows through that, you know, it's typically 10 points. So that's 48. So if you fade the, the, the top and, and it does one of those blow throughs and you scaled there, is that going to work within how much drawdown you have? If it isn't, then you know, you've got a flaw in your process. You have to go back and look, well, either I need more drawdown, which would justify the bigger account, but you know, is it worth it? Or you need to look at the setup again and say, where is it really right and wrong dollar wise? And um, you know, when you, that's why this fourth LRC was so useful because it like right now we're at the top and, and we're, we broke out of the, the 30 minute one and without seeing how much farther this has to go to really change trend, it's really hard to gauge this right now. But this is actually a really decent place to fade anywhere between these two. Again, remember I said, that's the sweet spot. If it breaks through both of them, then you know, you've got a trend, but we're so far away from that right now. And you know, then if you looked at this and say, well, where's the extreme? Well, SD2 is at 4,009. You know, well, you could you can kind of pull this down and say, where's the top of this? It's like 02. So yeah, it, it, this is between one and two, right in there again. So it, it 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 you'll see this over and over again if you watch these two things together, where where this is presenting a good, really you know, extreme opportunity like SD2 there. This is going to kind of agree with it, and it's going to kind of tell you, you know, where you should play that. So it's what it's saying right now is, you know, if it gets anything above here, you know, it's a, it's a really good play as long as it doesn't break from here really aggressively. If it does, get flat and 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 shoot for SD two. But this is a really good spot to play right now, statistically. Again, you know, it, it's right at that intersection. If you don't have the fourth one, you don't have the context. And and that was what it added. Let me show you. I'll, I'll take the fourth one off real quick or just hide it. And, um, and it, it, you know, we went back and forth on this and, and kept testing the results. And it, it really, um, you know, was, wait a minute, I made that. Oh, I, I made it visible. Duh. I want it invisible. Wait a minute. Maybe I think it's doing it. Hold on. I'll get to the questions in just a second. I think Ninja might have hung on me. Yeah, it's doing it. That's what's happening. It's, it's doing it. You know what? I'm going to. There we go. Okay, and there it is. So see how when I don't have that fourth one, I don't have that context. It looks like, okay, we're right at the extreme of the range and we are. But is this representing a change in direction if we get above that? And the answer is no, it's not. It, it, to change direction, we've got to get up, up in here. And if you zoom way out, you can say, oh yeah, okay, this is actually an ebb and flow range up here. So as soon as I turn that other one on, Again, what it does is it gives me context about where we are right now. And it, it's not a trading system. It's not a signal. It's just an additional piece of context that's just really powerful in that, you know, where should I be swarming and where shouldn't I? And, and this, look, look at NQ while this is reloading up here. It, it was really clear that you should be fading that. <laughs> And, and anywhere right up in here is a good fade. If it gets you know above that, then it's trending again, but it's not trending. You know We're working a, a really big ebb and flow range. So let's see, there's a couple of comments here. Um, can this be replicated? Okay, this is an ongoing problem, Alec. I, um, when you do this in SC, you, you, you don't get the slope visual for some reason. It doesn't draw linear regression channels the same way. And no matter how you mess with it, it's, it's hard to get it to look just like this. I shared the code for this with Lee. He thought he might be able to bang out um, a way to do. Oh, did you, were you able to do it, Robert? I thought, I thought you couldn't get it to work in SC. I mean, you can definitely do it for sure. How it oh, would, in, in think or swim, forget it. Yeah, think or swim, you cannot do it. Yeah, the I, for sure, no, there. I thought you couldn't get the slopes to work in Sierra chart. You should be able to. I, I mean, it's just LRC. Yeah. It's just adding another one. Uh, well, the last time we tried to do it, w when I was teaching the boot camp, we couldn't make it draw the lines in the same places. Uh, can mm -hmm. you guys uh, let me know if that works? Because, yeah, it does. I've okay. always been able to, but I haven't touched LRCs now in like over a year, so I'm not sure. Okay, well, the next person that makes it in Sierra, please post it in the pit and, and post a picture of this and a picture of mm -hmm. that. Just Could you yeah, do that? Oh, so. perfect. Yeah, Robert, can you please post that? Uh, we Because a couple of people have asked me for that uh, that aren't in the, the room right now, so... Yeah, and it, again, it's not a trading system, but if, you know, for example, if I blow this all the way up and you look at it, you see how it gives you that extra piece of context about where you are, and it, it's really powerful. If we just had these three over here, we can see we're at the top of the range, but we can't see, the, you know, 
the context of the range. That's why I added the third one. And, you know, it's funny while we were doing this, he said, you know, um, your, your order flow, you know, footprint people are going to really kill you because this is another horizontal line. I said, yeah, but it's such a powerful context. You know, if it's in that space between the two, that's a really good spot to swarm fade. You're wrong when it gets above both of them or below both of them by a significant amount. Sometimes it'll tap them and that's the perfect entry, you know, just like it does with the other, you know, the faster ones. And that's just the nature of regression. Remember, linear regression, regression, the math of regression, it's not a channel with a high and a low. It's a channel of the best fit using a sum of squares method of regression. So it, it, in English, best fit, you know, it can exceed it a little bit. That's okay when it does that. What you don't want, and here's another example of it being between the two and how perfect that is. Um, what you don't want to let it do is, is get down there, go through there and just keep going. Then you've got, you know, a high volume reversal. You've got a, a full blown change in direction. And that's the other thing. If you like high volume reversals, this gives you a really good visual about where to play them. And, and that's my favorite setup is high volume reversals. But, you know, again, people always say, well, how do you know when you're wrong? And how do you know when it's not reversing? I get it. You know, I've been looking at them for decades. It, to me, it's experience, but I can't teach experience. And, and but what I can do is I can ask, ask a mathematician and a math model to tell me how to visualize that. And this is what it came back with. But I thought that was fun. I thought I'd share it with you guys. Um, yeah, let, let me know, Alec, how it works in TradingView. I don't use that, but, you know, I know a lot of people play with it. And for visual stuff, it's fine. You know, you don't have to trade off of it. You just need it to be there so you can see it. But make sure you don't change the other settings. Use five seconds. And, and here's the, the settings for all four of them. Uh, and there's a reason they are where they are, okay? We tested a lot of variations. You want 25, 75, 300, and 600, and it's two standard deviations each way. Ninja calls that four, which is wrong. It's two standard deviations in each direction. And again, that's the, the reason the model works. Two standard deviations gives you, you know, 96% of the range. And when you, when you compare a couple of time frames that are very fast, close together, you see the inflections very, very clearly. It's a really powerful visual tool. Again, this is not buy here, sell here. This is when it's there, you'll know immediately if, if a swarming fading idea is right or wrong, particularly if it's in the gap between the two. That's the absolute best sweet spot. That's like right here and right here. I have it running on all four of them, but I'm not really paying that much attention to what it's doing in the others, other than it's working really well. Look at YM, same story. You know, when it's in between the two, absolutely the sweet spot. Maria, are you still here? You are. Look at, watch RTY, again, same thing. You know, it, it works the same way. Um, when it's right in there, you know, that's a really, really good spot to play. And particularly look at the delta, how it rolled over there. Perfect visualization of a high volume reversal. Came down from one end of the range, played around down here. And then, you know, once it, it held and that's all you're looking for, you know, easily can get a move back to the middle of the ranges. And that's typically your best target, the middle of the range. Sometimes it goes all the way to the other side of the range. But uh, anyway, what I did is I just made two big ones for the ones I trade the most like this. Um, but it, it works on all four indexes really well. I haven't tested it with anything else, but with the four indexes, it works really, really well. Okay. Um, let's see. Cool. All right. I think we've covered all the questions. Lee has a class coming up shortly. I promised him we'd be done before the top of the hour. So, he has a class today? Or a meeting. He's got something he needed. To oh, for. okay. <laughs> so anyway, uh, any quick questions or comments? Uh, yeah, give it a shot, Maria. I think you'll find it interesting. Uh, I hope the rest of you enjoyed that. And, and again, that was kind of the, here's an idea about how to be nimble. <laughs> you know, I, I've actually, and remember what I said, being nimble means scale down, be really precise where you use your full scale or where you swarm aggressively. And, um, and if there's any way you can fit that into the parameters of the 25K, that's the place to do it. You know, remember your objective with any of this crap, particularly in the evaluator space where, you know, any of these guys could disappear overnight, you know, is get funded and get above the withdraw threshold and start withdrawing. It's not, you know, to be the guy who can put up the, you know, the biggest p &L on any given day or whatever, like you see in their Facebook group, or these guys that are copying, you know, 20, 150K accounts. Why? You can make more money with five 25K accounts. And we actually tested that. 
we could not justify the 150 or the 250 under any circumstances. And, and obviously that's where uh, Apex is making some money. So anyway, all right, cool. Thank you guys, thank you. Am I saying your name correctly? Is it Idris? Is that, am I saying that correctly? I, I know I said it that way last time and then I wasn't sure. So please tell me, is that Idris? Is that correct? Perfect, okay, thank you. I, I, I know names are important, so I like to get them right, particularly because people always butcher mine. It's not mayhem, it's Jeff Mayhem, like May and then the letter M. It's actually a Hebrew word for water from a good well. All right, thank you everybody. Have a great weekend. If you're coming to my closing session today, it's gonna be a killer. We have such good movement today. We'll definitely have a good closing session. So uh, I'll see you then. Otherwise, keep it tight. And um, don't forget, Monday's a holiday. The Ides of Monday will be Tuesday. There's no Sunday reopen this week and the jigsaw scalping class on Monday is canceled obviously because the market's closed. And we credited back those of you that had already signed up. Yep. Have a good weekend. Thank See you, ya. JVC. Appreciate it. Good question. Um, bye.